Hello folks, uh, I'm Paul Thompson. I write a comic called Tales of the Hollow Earth. Uh, I'm also editor of the Newcastle Science Comic, which is a comic that's coming out in the autumn to accompany the British Science Festival. I think about comics a lot, probably more than, more than I actually uh, draw or write them. Um, and so addressing the theme of perception, I'd like to try to do that in three ways. One, to talk about how the layout of a page affects your perception of time in a comic. Secondly, about how the art style affects your perception of the empathy of a character, um, or their alienness or wrongness in the case of ghost stories. And thirdly, just because all of the examples I use tend to be stories about outsiders or people whose perception of reality is a little bit wrong, different, or skewed in some way. So there's, um, there's a video you can find on the internet uh, by Kurt Vonnegut, a science fiction writer, talking about the shapes of stories. And he says, he, he describes various kinds of stories, but this is the core shape of a story. Something's going along fine, a chap's walking in the woods, then he falls down a hole and that's a bad thing that happens to him. And then at the end of the story, he finds a way to get out of the hole. That's the basic shape of stories. Now, the thing with comics that makes them useful, particularly in education, is that you can see the whole story on the page simultaneously. You can see cause and effect. This is Calvin, out of Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin's a superhero. You can tell that by his cape. <laughs> Calvin can fly. Um, and occasionally, unfortunately, uh, reality begs to differ. And Calvin comes to the ground with a crash because reality is Calvin's worst enemy. Fortunately, however, Calvin is uh, immune to reality and it turns out that it's actually kryptonite that's causing Calvin's problems. And the point here that I want to make is that you can actually see the shape of the story. You can see the emotional journey on the page. It all happens simultaneously. Time travels from left to right. And even with larger comics, you can tell a lot about what's going on in the comic by the layout of the page. Something's running along the top here, and then there's a grid sort of imprisoning, and then something bounces at the bottom. And here we have Calvin and Hobbes again. This is the same layout as above. And you can see that Calvin is imprisoned in this life of virtue in this central area, preferring his existence in the slightly wide snow-filled panels at the bottom. The layout of the page tells you about the story. So, just moving on from Calvin and Hobbes to talk a little bit about the, um, the artwork in comics. And you can't really talk about comics too much without mentioning Scott McCloud. And this is a diagram by Scott McCloud in his book, Understanding Comics. It's a set, essentially an axis, and you can put different kinds of artworks on this axis. Reality is down the bottom left, photo comics and the like. Towards the right hand side, minimalism, stick men, um, and words, and Tintin. And at the top, you tend to get more abstract comics. They tend to be sort of very cartoony, funny animal style comics. Here's just a layout of a few examples. So reality, down here, photo comics. Um, photo comics are interesting, but you can't really use them unless you're careful, because photography brings a lot of baggage with it, and the other thing is photography um, reads as a single moment in time, whereas a comic panel is read from left to right, and you have people talking in it, and a comic panel takes place over a number of seconds. A photograph doesn't do that. So you've got to be careful when using photography in comics. Usually, it's for humorous effect. Realistically rendered comics, moving up towards abstraction here, you get lots of fantasy and sci-fi comics that are realistically rendered, largely because what you're wanting to see with these kind of comics is the props, the spaceships, the heroes, the weaponry, the swords, that kind of thing. Moving over towards the right, things get a little bit more abstract and a little bit more minimal. And towards the bottom right, you get minimal characters. Tintin, you probably recognize. There isn't much to the drawing of Tintin. He's two dots in a line. 
And the beauty of two dots in a line, it means that you can empathize with the character because there's nothing there to distract you. There's nothing there to give him a personality that you dislike. Unlike this guy up here, there's nothing about Tintin that you can dislike. So this kind of area is good for horror comics um, and adventure stories. I see a lot of uh, adventure stories done in this kind of very minimalist style. Um, the characters are drawn minimally. Usually the backgrounds are drawn very technically in these kind of things. And it works really well because it allows the reader to play along and to be the hero a lot better than painted comics or photo comics when it's quite clearly someone else. Horror comics um, are kind of working really well when they're a bit cartoony in their characters as well. So the characters are sort of minimalist, but they're also a little bit soft and pliable. And that does emphasize, well, they're soft and pliable, and this is going to be a horror comic, um, <laughs> which is useful. <clears throat> Further up in the field here, um, towards abstraction, you get some very strange comics. This is Owly. Owly is beautiful, and it's lovely, and it's very minimalism, and it's about loneliness and a chap, uh, well, an owl, um, who's... Lots of things come into his perception that are a bit strange and alien, and he doesn't understand them, and he usually ends up making friends with them. That's the nature of Owly. This side... No, no, that doesn't happen over here. This is a comic called Alien, um, which is allegedly a comic for alien children. Um, <laughs> And it, it subverts that quite a lot. There's a little bit of body horror in there, and it does give a, very, it does give a, a sense of, I just don't know what's going on, and I don't know why all of these characters are okay with what's going on, because I'm not. <laughs> all three of these comics use an abstract language. Owly has no language at all, and he speaks entirely in symbols. Alien over here, again, speaks in symbols. And uh, the comic at the top here is called Tales of the Bean World, and that has its own way of abstracting language. Uh, they all talk in very strange accents. Um, and this helps to give this sense of an alien world that you don't quite understand and you don't quite know what you're seeing or why. So, minimalist characters, you can empathise with them. Distorted abstract surroundings, they scare you after a while. Uh, this is a... And there's a lot of examples of this in a comic called the Lovecraft Anthology. Um, and if anyone knows the work of H.P. Lovecraft, you'll know that he's, he really enjoys his abstract in undescribable horrors. <laughs> um, so abstracting the art style really helps with this kind of thing. Um, moving on more to the, towards the layout of the page. When you turn a page, you'll often get a a panel that changes the scene, and it's usually a wide panel. You turn the page, you're in a new place. And in a lot of manga, a lot of Japanese comics, you'll find that it connects to the edge of the page. It'll go full bleed on the page, and it sort of emphasizes that this is part of a, a wider reality here. And then you go into regular panels, and then you meet Barbara. And she connects to the edge of the page, but it's the bottom of the page. Her reality in this comic called I Kill Giants is that she's waiting for the giants to arrive and she's going, she's going to kill them. Um, whether or not the giants do arrive and the nature of that, I recommend that you read the comic to find out because it, it is definitely a comic about outsiders and having a different perception of your world. It's tragic and beautiful and you should read it. This is a comic called Joe the Barbarian. It's a slightly different way of connecting reality and not reality. Uh, Joe is very ill, he's not a well man, and the whole, the whole uh, book is about Joe traveling from his attic to his basement where his pills are so that he can not die. He's hallucinating wildly, um, and it's raining outside, his house is falling to bits and it's in the middle of a storm. And a lot of the panels in which Joe is in are framed by whole page spreads of the house showing where he is in the house. And sometimes they show how he perceives the house, 
which is frequently very different to how it actually is, especially when he's left the taps running, which he has in that right-hand column. He's, he experiences the house as an epic fantasy landscape. It's a good comic. This is a webcomic called His Face All Red. It's, um, it's by Emily Carroll, and it, and it does some interesting things with time. It repeats the same panel frequently, and it has wide panels sat on a dark field. And the fact that these panels are silent means that you're not really quite sure whether this scene is taking place over three hours, or three days, or three weeks. We don't know how long this guy on the left has been holding court. We don't know how long this guy on the right has been looking at him like he doesn't quite trust him. And wide panels like that um, are used quite frequently in comics to extend time so that you, well, it can be an indefinite time period that it's happening over. There's another ghost story, uh, Weird Tales, a comic called Underwater Welder, um, in which a guy works as an underwater welder and on one occasion he returns from Okay. <laughs> and he returns, he returns from the sea um, to a town that looks very much like his, the town he left, but there's something very different and something wrong with it. And, it's, and the style of artwork, the watercolours, um, well, yeah, the watercolours give it a sense of not being quite real and not being quite solid, and it works really well in this comic. Again, wide panels because a lot of time passes and then they start to introduce vertical bars that start to constrict the character a bit, start to imprison him. And unlike wide panels, when you start to, in, when you start to introduce verticals into the scene, you get grids. And grids are often used in comics to create a beat, a rhythm of, a rhythm of events, time passing over a short period of time, usually, a process of some kind. If you want to put people in a process, and sometimes in horror comics you need to do that kind of thing, it's not good for them, they use a grid. So this is a guy, he's, um, he's an immigrant, he's experiencing bureaucracy, and he doesn't quite understand it, and he's arriving in a world that's completely alien to him. Um, and he experiences life as just one step after another that he has to go through. A rhythm has been created there. Grids can also be used to create a prison. This is Duncan the Wonder Dog. I think it's a bit dark, this one, but uh, Duncan is a dog, um, and all of his friends are animals, and they exist in this area, actually in a literal prison, and the grids help restrict everything, and they're drawn very sharply, not in a fluid way like with Underwater Welder. Everything is very real and very imprisoned there. With horror comics, yep. Grids are used to create a sense of inevitability and claustrophobia. Um, this is Anatomy Lesson by Alan Moore and uh, Zombo by Al Ewing and Henry Flint uh, in 2000 AD. You must read 2000 AD every week. It's important. <laughs> um, and it creates a sense of inevitability through the grid and claustrophobia through the grid, the eyeballs, the, the cut scenes. You can't quite see what the camera's focusing on. And, you know, bad things happen to people in this comic. Another grid here, seen through a CCTV camera. This is a comic called We Three. It's about a girl who sets free um, her animal chargers. Her, anim her animal chargers are military trained cybernetic cats, dogs and rabbits. <laughs> and she wants to set them free. And this is the CCTV footage of her doing so. It's inevitable. When they get set free, they perceive reality at a different speed to humans. And the comic is very artful in how it expresses this. The cat is so fast, it slices through time and the panels have been aligned vertically and the cat is allowed to actually jump through the panels and slice through them and indeed slice through the soldiers. It gets a bit nasty in places. Oops, I jumped one. No problem. It gets a bit nasty in places. You missed nasty. <laughs> um, 
but the, that's not all the comics got. It slows down, again, wide panels, an indefinite amount of time. The dog and the cat and the rabbit here are sat on a hillside pondering what they've done. The dog is contemplating the possibility that he might have been a bad dog. The panel connects to the edge of the page. The dog stares off the right-hand side into the void. The dog's not in a good place in this comic. Um, uh, that's called We Three by Grant Morrison. I really do recommend it. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a lot to it. It's very clever. Um, so we talked of, I've talked about uh, comic characters that perceive reality differently and some of the methods that comic artists use to alter your perception of time in comics. As we see uh, wide panels, an indefinite amount of time passing here, a doomed planet, desperate scientists, last hope, kindly couple. This is uh, the origin story of uh, one of our most famous comic book aliens. And uh, it slows down time, and then when you turn the page, time stops. And that's beautiful, in my opinion. That's it. I've talked about time, comics, aliens, outsiders. I've put a full list of all of the comics I've talked about at that address, and I've got some outside if anyone wants to talk about them. Thank you.